Apostle Paul said these words when he was on trial. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God. We're going to sing as we begin our service tonight, O God of our fathers, creator and Lord. Let us together bow our heads for some prayer. <clears throat> Paul the Apostle wrote these words to Timothy in the first chapter of 1 Timothy. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, although formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. 
But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Dear God, our Father, as we think back to the origins of the great mission of the gospel to the Gentiles, we think of your servant Paul, this man whom you raised up and, as he says himself, gave strength to, gave strength for his service and his evangelism and his building up of churches. And we thank you so much, dear Father, that even though he was in the past a blasphemer and a persecutor, a violent man who'd hated the church and persecuted them, yet you gave him mercy, you showed mercy. In fact, the grace of the Lord Jesus overflowed for him with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And we thank you so much for that overflowing grace, which we know, dear Father, has been overflowing because of the Lord Jesus for all these centuries, and we too are recipients of it, though we, like Paul, have deserved nothing of it, because we too have been opponents of, of the real Christian faith and of your loving leadership and lordship in our lives. So we want to thank you again, dear Father, for the grace that we have not deserved, the grace that Paul didn't deserve, and Timothy, that none of us have deserved, and yet which you have so lavishly and fully given to us. And we pray, dear Father, that you will fill our hearts with thankfulness as you filled Paul's heart with thankfulness, and that you'll fill our hearts and our wills with strength and determination as well to serve you. Not that we could ever think of serving you as Paul did, because we know that his ministry was a unique and extraordinary one, but we pray that you will give us at least a portion of his determination to love you and to pass on the good news about you and the Lord Jesus to many. And in our service tonight, our time here together, we pray that you will build us up because we're weak. We pray that you will enlarge our thinking and give us grand and great thoughts of you because by nature our thoughts of you are small. We pray that you will take us and guide us and equip us for the future. We pray that every one of us, dear Father, may have opportunities, even this week, to say something, a word of commendation about our Lord Jesus Christ to help others to think about him and to be drawn to him. So be close to us tonight, dear Father. Help us to hear your word afresh and to respond to it afresh with ready hearts, hearts that are ready and wills that are ready to obey you, to delight in you and to love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, let me say, I don't think I said it earlier, but let me say how good it is to see everybody here tonight and a very warm welcome, especially if you're new to our, our company here tonight. We shall, I think, be serving refreshments at the end of the service. It's a good chance for us to mix up, especially to mix up with our Iranian brothers and sisters who, who are meeting downstairs. If you've never met some of them, uh, you've got a treat in store, so do go down there and enjoy coffees and teas with them and talk to them as well. We shall be celebrating the communion service directly after our, the rest of the service is over. So if you'd like to stay for that, uh, just stay in your places and we will just proceed immediately uh, after the rest of it is, is finished. Now, just one or two things to say regarding this week. This Wednesday in the evening at half past seven, we'll be having our church prayer meeting downstairs in the Lomond room as usual. <coughs> Please do join us if you possibly can. Next Saturday, 8th of October, Scottish Women's Bible Convention. I shan't ask you to put up your hands if you've booked up for that, but that, I think, uh, threatens to be, I mean, promises to be a wonderful time. And if you'd like to know more about it, Agnes Brough, who's now going to raise her hand without standing up, she's the person to, uh, to talk to afterwards. Uh, there's still places, are there, Agnes? Last time I checked, there were 53. 53 more places? <coughs> okay, very good. Good, we'll have a word with her. But that, that, that looks like a really good day, and I think it would be a great encouragement um, to the ladies. Next Sunday, we're looking forward to welcoming our old friend David Jackman from London 
uh, to come and be our preacher. He's been here several times before. Many of you will remember him, but uh, that's something for next Sunday. And tonight, at this very moment, there's a service taking place at Gilcomston South Church in Aberdeen in which Jerry Middleton is being inducted as their new minister. So that's an important new beginning for Gilcomston Church. And some of you will have contacts and uh, friends there. And we'll pray for them a little bit later in the service. Willie Philip and a number of others from here have gone up to help with that service. So we'll remember them in our prayers. Good. We're now going to have another hymn. So let's turn to number 682. 682. Jesus, lover of my soul. 682. Well, we turn now to the life-giving, nourishing Word of God, the Bible. And let's open our Bibles at the first letter to Timothy, chapter 2. And if you have one of our hardback Bibles, you'll find this on page 991, 991. 
and our reading is the whole of the second chapter of 1 Timothy. First of all then, Paul writes to his friend and young colleague, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority, <clears throat> authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is the word of the Lord, and may the Lord make it a blessing to us this evening. Well, now we're going to have a quiet moment when the offering will be taken up. The musicians will pl pray for us, play for us, and uh, do let's perhaps read over this second chapter of 1 Timothy in the quietness. Let us pray. 
Paul the Apostle writes this to the Thessalonians in his second letter, chapter 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much that the vision of Paul the Apostle was, and the desire of Paul was that your word, the true gospel, might speed ahead and be honored, that it might be received by many people. We thank you for his wonderful vision to get the gospel out across as much of the world as he possibly could. And we think of the way in which that gospel has gone to all four corners of the earth in these 20 centuries. We know that as Paul taught the Thessalonians, it would be opposed by wicked and evil people who do not have faith. But we thank you too that you are faithful and are willing and able to establish the church and the work of the gospel and to guard us against the schemes of the evil one. Our dear Father, our thoughts turn first of all to the church of Gilcomston South in Aberdeen and to the service that is taking place there this very evening. And we do pray for the congregation there that the word of the Lord may be honored and may continue to speed forth from that congregation in the city of Aberdeen and further afield as well. And we pray that with the induction of a new minister, Jerry Middleton, you will give the congregation great encouragement to be firm and steady in their faith and their witness. We pray for Jeremy himself and ask that you will strengthen him and give him great wisdom as he seeks to take a lead in the congregation and to preach your word faithfully week by week. Encourage them, we pray. Build them up. Give them an expanded vision for the work and help them to be strong and brave. And we pray that you will defeat any schemes of the evil one to try to divide them or to to send them off course in some way. And then, dear Father, we want to pray as well for all those who are downstairs in this building tonight, our brothers and sisters from Iran, and quite a number of others who are perhaps not brothers or sisters yet, and yet they're there, they're listening, they're wanting to learn and to find out what this Christian gospel is. And we pray that you will be lovingly and wonderfully, graciously opening eyes and hearts to hear, to understand and to receive the gospel. So please bless our Iranian work here, and we commit to you the leaders from our church who are seeking to help that work to grow, both English-speaking and um, Farsi-speaking as well, that you will strengthen them all and give them wisdom and unity and joy in explaining the good news of Christ to many. And for ourselves, dear Father, give us this evening, we pray, Open ears and hearts to hear your word, ready to obey it and to love it. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's sing together again in our hymn books, number 558. O God, who shaped the starry skies and made the sun in splendor rise, whose love our life imparts, Still may that same creative word, which formless void and darkness heard, be known within our hearts. A prayer that we shall understand and rejoice in the word of God. Number 558.
Let's turn then to our second chapter in 1 Timothy, page 991. My title for this evening is Structuring the Church for Evangelism. Now, it may sound perverse, but we can be grateful for the way in which some of the first century churches went off the rails in the first century. Just think of it. There were severe problems in the Galatian churches. There were severe problems at Colossae. Corinth was a train wreck. The Ephesian churches were teetering on the brink of disaster. And the result of all these difficulties was Paul's letters. Without these disastrous departures from true Christianity, Paul would not have needed to write these letters. But these churches kept on veering off the right road. And Paul, because he loved the churches so much, had to correct them. He was not willing just to stand by and watch them implode. He was determined to bring them back to truth and reality. And 1 Timothy is a prime example of Paul wrestling with the heart and mind of a church so as to bring it back to the path of right understanding and right behavior. Now, I know that in a formal sense, this letter is addressed to Timothy himself, and rightly we call it 1 Timothy. But in reality, it's addressed to the church at Ephesus, where Timothy was temporarily stationed so as to discipline the church and rescue it from its waywardness. Just look with me again at chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. Why? That you may charge certain persons not to teach any different or heterodox doctrine. Now, that was the big problem at Ephesus. People in the fellowships there were bringing in strange ideas, wrong doctrines, which led to, chapter 1, verse 4, speculations, speculative talk. Chapter 1, verse 6, vain discussion. Chapter 1, verse 19, shipwrecked faith. Chapter 4, verse 7, 4, 7, irreverent, silly myths. And chapter 6, verse 20, irreverent babble and contradictions. So we can be very grateful for the problems of the first century churches because they caused Paul to write these matchless letters which are as useful to us as they were to their first readers, because the same kinds of false teaching and corrupting influence surface in every generation. And this is why Paul's letters have been so influential and so beneficial to the Church of Christ for 20 centuries. We need them today as much as ever. What tends to happen in the history of the Church is that a particular congregation, a particular church, flourishes for a generation or maybe for two or three generations, and then the work runs into the buffers because wrong influences creep in and are not checked. I can think of one or two churches that I know in England which have been strong and excellent for 50 or 60 years and still are because the leadership of those churches has insisted that the Bible determines the life and practice of the church. But I can also think of churches which used to be a great force for the gospel perhaps in the 19th century or the early 20th, but are now a mere shell of a church because the Bible was allowed to drift into the margins of church life. So let's thank God for these corrective letters of Paul the Apostle, and let's continue to accept them, not as the words of a mere man, but as the teaching of Christ himself, because after all, the apostles, by definition, are his mouthpiece to every generation. We're looking now at chapter 2 in this letter. Let's see how Paul begins it. First of all, then. Now, the line of his argument in chapter 1 is something like this. Timothy, I've left you there in Ephesus to stop this false teaching, this silly, irreverent babbling on about myths and genealogies. These foolish people, they profess to be Bible teachers. They claim to be teachers of the law of God, but they don't know what they're talking about. They're strangers to the true gospel, the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. In fact, I am a prime example of the grace of God shown in the gospel because the Lord rescued me, me of all people, a blasphemer, a former persecutor, a violent man. 
but the Lord saves sinners, and I am the worst of them. But he saved me as an example, a kind of prize exhibit, so that other people, seeing a wretch like me being saved, will realize that they too can be saved by the same grace. So Timothy, my boy, strap on your armor and fight the good fight. Clear out what is false in the Ephesian churches and establish the true gospel and the lifestyle that expresses it. Your work is the gospel and the ethics that accord with it. First of all then, chapter 2, verse 1, first of all, in view of all this, I urge dot, dot, dot. So do you see the force that lies behind this opening, verse in, uh, opening phrase in verse 1? In chapter 1, Paul is saying, out with the false, in with the true. So let's set about establishing the proper structures which characterize a true church. And here's the first thing, chapter 2, verse 1, that the church must learn to pray for political stability in the nation. And here's the second thing, chapter 2, verse 8, that the church must recognize the God-given differences between men and women. So in this second chapter, Paul is teaching Timothy that if a church is going to function properly as a gospel church, as a church that commends Christ and his gospel to the world, certain things have got to be understood and set in place and practiced. Now the same is true of the later chapters, 3, 4, 5, and 6, where Paul develops this teaching right through the letter on exactly the same lines. A true Christian church, a church which acts as a pillar and buttress of the truth, will look like this and this and this and this. And Paul, through the letter, deals with four or five critically important areas of church life. So you could give this letter the subtitle, The Characteristics of a True Gospel or True Christian Church. Well, let's take this second chapter now under these two main headings. First then, a true gospel church learns to pray for political stability in the nation so that the gospel can be freely proclaimed. Verse 1, first of all then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings, that's pretty comprehensive, that's every type of prayer, should be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now do you find it rather surprising that Paul should put this item in such a prominent position as a first of all. Is it really a top priority for Christians that we should pray for our rulers and governments? And isn't it also surprising to see in verse 2 that the purpose of praying for our political leaders is that we should lead a peaceful and quiet life? Hasn't Paul been urging Timothy back in chapter 1 verse 18 to wage the good warfare, to be a battler, so isn't there some discrepancy between a battling Timothy and a quiet and peaceful congregation? Well, the key idea in verses 1 and 2 is this, that if the nation, in this case the empire, is secure and well-governed, the gospel can be preached and taught with much greater freedom. But if law and order break down, it becomes much harder for evangelists like Paul to travel about and much harder to proclaim the gospel publicly because freedom of speech becomes restricted where anarchy and violence prevail. I imagine, for example, that it's almost impossible to preach the gospel in Syria today because of the destruction of law and order in so many parts of the country. I guess there are a few brave Christian souls who are doing it, but it's enormously harder where normal human relationships are so disrupted and where suffering is so acute. Well, let's work our way through this paragraph and we'll notice the details. Pray for kings, writes Paul, and for all who are in high positions. I once went regularly to a prayer meeting dedicated to the work of overseas mission. It was a missionary prayer meeting. This was back in the 1980s, before the Eastern Communist bloc began to crumble. And I remember there were one or two very keen members of the prayer group who used to pray for the conversion to Christ of the top man in the Soviet Union, who in those days was Mikhail Gorbachev, and also for the top leaders in China and other communist countries. Now it was a loving and kind thing for those Christians to pray for the conversion of political leaders like that, and I don't criticize them for a moment for doing it. 
But what Paul has in mind here is quite different. He's not saying, pray for pagan kings to be converted. He's saying, pray for kings and rulers so that they should govern wisely and well, upholding law and order, so that the churches should be able to lead a peaceful, godly, well-ordered life. Why? Well, if the churches can live in peace in the towns and cities of a well-governed nation, their influence is going to be much more powerful. Their non-Christian neighbors will notice them. They'll have the chance to notice them. They'll notice their godly and dignified lifestyle, as Paul puts it at the end of verse 2, godly and dignified. And it's precisely that godly, dignified lifestyle which so often attracts other people to Christ. I'm sure that many of us began to be drawn to Christ because we had Christian friends and neighbors who lived a godly and dignified life. And as we looked at them, we thought this is human life as it should be, not chaotic and unprincipled, but solid and warm and steady and loving. So what is Paul's real concern? Is it simply a concern that Christians should be able to live comfortably and peacefully? No. His concern is for the gospel to be broadcast far and wide across the earth. Look how he reasons it through. Verse 3. It is good and pleasing in God's sight for the churches to live in peace and security because, verse 4, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the truth, verse 5, is clear and unique and defined. There is one God says Paul, and, and this is the critical qualification, there is one mediator. What Paul means is that there is only one mediator. He writes, there is one God and one mediator, but the force of it is to say that there is only one God and only one mediator. Now, as I say, Paul's insistence that there's only one mediator between God and men, that is the critical phrase here. Faiths other than Christianity believe that there is only one God. Judaism has always believed that there is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. That's the starting point of the Hebrew creed. Islam believes passionately that there is only one God. Judaism and Islam are monotheistic as much as Christianity. Even some folk who follow some of the animist religions in Africa and places like that believe that beyond the spirits, there is a great supreme being. So a modern person, a 21st century person, might say to us, many faiths believe that there is only one God. So why should not the one God, who wants all people to be saved, save them in a variety of ways? Some through Eastern religions, some through Judaism, some through Islam, or through other cults? Paul's answer is that the one and only God has provided only one mediator, the man Christ Jesus, the only one who can represent God to man and man to God. Because Jesus is God, he can address man's need and meet it. And because he is man, he can truly represent the human race and bear the penalty for our sins in our place. There is no other such mediator in the world. No one else could do for us what Jesus has done for us. As he said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. A mediator is a go-between. And in his unique go-between role, Jesus has satisfied the just anger of God against our sin by accepting the wages of sin on our behalf. And he has opened the kingdom of heaven to all who run to him with a sense of their moral bankruptcy. Look how Paul unpacks it further in verse 6. Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Now that phrase echoes Jesus' own words. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's a great word. If we're Christians, the ransom has been paid for us. We're no longer held captive by the power of sin. We are now liberated, free men, free women, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Now let's not lose sight of where Paul is taking us. 
In verses 1 to 7, he's pressing on the Ephesians the truth that because there is only one God and because there is only one mediator between God and man, the whole world needs to hear this one truth. There is no other truth. There won't be some other saving truth to be discovered on the plains of North America, for example, or in the forests of Africa, or in the ancient civilizations of Japan or China. Paul says in verse 4 that God desires all people to be saved, but he insists that there is only one way. Just notice the global vision, the extent of it in this paragraph. Verse 1, prayers to be made for all people. That's a big word, short word, but a big word. Verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions. Verse 4, God who desires all people to be saved. Verse 6, Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. And verse 7, for whose sake was Paul appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher? For the Gentiles. And what he means by that word is the whole world beyond the borders of Israel. It's the gospel of one mediator who gave his life as a ransom for all. It is the only gospel. Friends, do you believe that? Now this brings us back to Paul's starting point in verse 1. It's because this gospel is the only gospel for the whole world that Paul longs to put wings on his sandals and to travel as far as he possibly can preaching and teaching. But he and his colleagues can only do that if the roads are safe and if people can move about without being afraid that their throats are going to be cut at every corner. And that kind of freedom can only come about if kings and governors are exercising a firm and just rule in their territories. Let me put this in slightly different terms. Paul is teaching that the church and the state should recognize their duties to each other. The responsibility of the state is to preserve law and order and peaceful relations as far as possible, to maintain a stable society in which the church can operate freely and preach the gospel without hindrance. The church, on the other hand, is responsible to pray for the nation's leaders and lawmakers, and of course to obey the law of the land, unless of course that law directly contravenes the ethics of the Bible, in which case we are to obey God and not men and go to prison if necessary. Now for us today in this country, let's pray often for our national leaders. You'll have noticed, I'm sure, that our minister, Willie, often does this almost every week in our morning services. He does it, I'm sure, because of this paragraph that we're studying. We pray for world leaders and we pray for national leaders so that the gospel should be released across the world and across the nation. So let's pray, not just in our, our corporate prayers, but in our private prayers as well, for Mrs. May at Westminster and Mrs. Sturgeon at Holyrood and for their senior colleagues and advisors. Whether or not we like their party politics, party politics are not the issue. Stability and security in the nation, that's the issue. That's Paul's issue here in verse 2. If you asked Paul whether he was a socialist or a Tory or a nationalist, he would have said, don't be daft. There's something much more important at stake here. And thinking back to the church at Ephesus, when the church learns to focus on the proclamation of the gospel, it's going to have no time for idle speculations and vain discussions and irreverent babble about myths and genealogies. It's got some real work to do to tell the world that there is only one God and only one mediator and only one way to be saved. So in verses 1 to 7, Paul lays out for Timothy and for the Ephesian church the priority of evangelism. Out with the corrupting influence of these false teachers with their introverted and silly agenda, myths and genealogies and so on, in with the true agenda of the Christian church, which is in effect the Great Commission, getting the only saving gospel out into the world and praying for the political stability which will make that possible. Well now secondly, in verses 8 to 15, Paul teaches the church to recognize the God-given differences between men and women. Now, friends, do you feel a bit anxious about this passage? Does your stomach tighten 
at the prospect of studying this paragraph. Well, cast anxieties aside, does not God include every passage in the Bible for our blessing, for our good, for our happiness? Of course he does. We'll only find this passage unpalatable if we're nursing a determination to follow our culture's values rather than the values and teaching of God. So let's pause now for five seconds and quietly ask the Lord to give us a heart to obey him gladly and thoroughly. Amen. A movement or trend in society can be wrong and harmful in many ways without being wrong in every way. And that is surely true of the secular feminist movement, which has been so influential in the past century or two. For example, aren't you glad that British universities finally opened their doors to women students in about the year 1870? It's only about 140 years ago. Isn't that amazing? I'm very glad about that. Aren't you glad that barely a century ago, I forget the exact date, was it 1920? When, when was the vote given to women? 28? Whenever it was. Less than a century ago. Aren't you glad that that happened? I certainly am. Aren't you glad that strenuous efforts are being made today for women to receive the same pay as men when they do the same job? I'm certainly glad about that. There are aspects of modern feminism which have greatly improved the lot of women. Now, the Bible teaches that men and women are equal in status, equal in status. And the things that I've just mentioned, universities and uh, voting and so on, uh, these things have greatly helped to raise the status of women to a point of greater equality. And in those ways, modern feminism is very much in line, in tune with the Bible. But... While the Bible teaches that men and women are equal in status and in dignity, it also insists that men and women are different in function, that they have distinct and different roles to play, both in society and in marriage and in the life of the church. They are interdependent, but they are not interchangeable. And it's this aspect of the Bible's teaching which secular feminism rebels against. And the passage in front of us is a prime example of the Bible's teaching that the roles of men and women are not interchangeable. Well, now Paul has a word for the men first. Verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Now, almost certainly this anger and quarreling is a byproduct of the false teaching at Ephesus. If you get into interminable discussions about genealogies and uh, things like that, it's likely to lead to quarrels. Now, it's not that women are so sweet-natured and sugary and spicy that they would never quarrel and never get angry. But I think it's true to say that men as a gender are more inclined than women to be aggressive and to want to dominate other men. We speak of alpha males. We never speak, as far as I know, of alpha females. The sinful male nature somehow wants to squash other men. Think of the front row of the scrum in an international rugby match. What do those men say to each other? They certainly speak to each other. What do they say to to each other as they bend down and lock their heads? Do they say, for example, it's charming to meet you, Patrick. I do hope you're enjoying the weather. The sun generally shines at Murrayfield. I don't think that's the sort of conversation that goes on. Think of Prime Minister's question time in the House of Commons. Think over the last few years, David Cameron versus Gordon Brown, and then Ed Miliband, and then Jeremy Corbyn. Now, the point of those sessions, I suppose they're discussing questions, but the point of the sessions really is to deliver a knockout blow. And the victor, when he delivers that blow, crows over his opponent like a cockerel on a dunghill. So Paul is saying to the men of the church, brothers, don't be like that. It is better for God to be mastering you as you pray than for you to be mastering each other as you fight with words. In verse 8, 
Paul is countering the sinful tendency of men to want to dominate each other. He's saying, no, let the Lord dominate you. Pray together. And of course, the implication is work lovingly together, support each other, rather than trying to establish pecking orders of dominance. Well, now, before we, we, we turn to verse 9, let's remind ourselves of the Bible's teaching, which comes largely from Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, about the characteristic temptations of men and women. We won't turn up Genesis 3 at this point, but just think about the Garden of Eden for a moment. Eve sinned, Adam and Eve both sinned, but Eve sinned by allowing herself to be deceived by the devil, and thereby submitting to the devil at that point, and not to her husband who surely had told her beforehand about the Lord's command not to eat the fruit of that fatal tree. Adam sinned by weakly abdicating responsibility. He not only stood by and allowed his wife to eat the forbidden fruit, he ate it himself when she offered it to him. And in that one fateful episode, we see the characteristic temptations of both men and women. The woman's temptation will be to dominate the man and make a bid for leadership over him. And the man's temptation will be to shrink back wimpishly from taking responsibility for leadership. So when God, later in Genesis 3, pronounces judgment on both the serpent and Eve and Adam, he says to Eve, your desire, and this is your temptation, your desire will be to master him. And to Adam, he says, Because you listened to your wife, which means because you submitted to her, and have disobeyed my command about the fruit, cursed is the ground because of you. The whole environment cursed because of you, Adam. So the entry into the world of sin and death and every disorder is traced in the Bible directly back to the disobedience of both Adam and Eve. She disobeyed the Lord's command and allowed the serpent to master her and deceive her, as Paul shows in our verse 14 here, and Adam disobeyed the Lord by his cowardly and weak decision to submit to his wife, even though submission to her involved rejecting the Lord's authority. So woman's characteristic temptation is to dominate and lead man. Man's characteristic temptation is to abdicate the responsibility of taking the lead. And inasmuch as we behave like this, we reverse the God-given order of man taking the lead and woman being his helper. Now, you may be thinking, in this passage here in 1 Timothy 2, is it perhaps just about marriage? Or is it about men and women in the church in general? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, that famous passage, Paul is teaching about marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. But here in 1 Timothy 2, Paul broadens the scope, and he's writing about Christian men and Christian women, not about husbands and wives as such. He's writing here about the life of the church, the whole church, when it meets together, and how it behaves corporately. Yes, he refers to Adam and Eve by name in verses 13 and 14, but not because he's writing about marriage. It's because he's writing about men and women. He's holding Adam up here as the prototype man, not as the prototype husband. And Eve here is the prototype woman, not the prototype wife. To try, to try to restrict what Paul is saying in this passage solely to the marriage relationship is, I think, to read the passage dishonestly and with a view to avoiding its far-reaching implications. So what is Paul teaching here? We'll boil it down to two headings. First, appropriate adornment for women, and secondly, appropriate attitude for the women of the church. First then, appropriate adornment. Now, Paul is not saying here, just look at it carefully, Paul is not saying that Christian women should not adorn themselves. In fact, quite the opposite. Look at verse 9. Women should adorn themselves, but with the right adornment, namely, respectable apparel, worn with modesty and self-control and not with inappropriate adornment, which he describes as braided hair, gold, pearls, and costly attire. 
And then he returns to right adornment in verse 10, which is, he says, good works. So a life of action and activity, serving others in all sorts of ways. Now, it would be a mistake, I think, to read verse 9 too legalistically, so as to make the church end up with a list of minute rules, in which, for example, braids might be distinguished from plaits. It's not braids, it's plaits I'm wearing. Or real gold and real pearls might be, dis might be uh, distinguished from mock gold. Well, Dr. Philip, these are artificial pearls. Or perhaps a rule that uh, when, when, when he talks of uh, expensive attire, maybe it's okay to buy a dress that costs 70 pounds, but don't you dare to buy a dress that costs 100. No. Paul's point in verses 9 and 10 is very closely linked with what he says in verses 11 and 12. The danger with a woman going to town on her personal appearance is that the more gorgeously she is decked out, the more she can wrap the men around her little finger. Isn't that what's going on? For example, think of this very place an hour ago, just before the evening service begins. It's 6.25 on a Sunday evening, and a gorgeously dressed woman sweeps into the grand hall. What happens? All the men turn their heads, don't they? Well, they turn them back again very quickly. <laughs> but they've turned them. You see, she is exercising a certain power over them. Paul is not telling her to come to church in frumpy, ugly clothes, the worst she can find. What he's saying is, care for others and serve them. Don't make a bid to be admired. There's an appropriate adornment and an inappropriate one. And it's to do with exercising power over men. Now, this leads straight on into the second point. In verses 11 to 14, Paul is teaching an appropriate attitude of women towards men. <clears throat> and that is that in the church's work of teaching and learning, it's not the only thing the church does, but when it comes to teaching and learning, Paul is saying that the men should be the leaders. Their leadership is primarily expressed in their role as teachers. And the women should learn, as Paul puts it in verse 11, with all submissiveness. Now, what Paul has in mind here is the gathered congregation, like this group tonight, where there are numbers of adult men and adult women meeting together. But Paul encourages women to teach in other contexts. So if you read Titus chapter 2, you'll see that he says that the older women in the church should teach and train the younger women. It's the most important ministry. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul remembers with obvious approval that Timothy, as a young child, learned his faith from his mother and his grandmother. Paul is strongly encouraging the women to teach and train each other and to teach and train the young. But the idea that a woman should be the church's senior teacher or the church's senior pastor, that's something that Paul will not allow because it's a reversal of the God-given order, an order which is rooted not in first century culture, but in the original blueprint of creation, as verses 13 and 14 make clear. So it's not a transient cultural matter. It's something which is written into the way that God has made the human race from the beginning. Therefore, friends, let us be willing to accept this. Our culture today cries out against it, often fiercely. But our job is to be obedient to the Lord and not to our culture. If we will dare to resist culture and follow the Lord, the result will be happy churches, united churches. But where a church resists this teaching on men and women, resentment, unhappiness and division build up. And the real work of the Lord's people is hindered. There are churches which claim to be Bible-believing churches which would never have a passage like this read and preached in public on a Sunday. Just wouldn't want to open it. Now, those are compromised churches. Let's dare to believe that God will bless us when we obey the Bible. When it boils down to it, we will either love the Lord or we will love the world. The Bible teaches us to recognize and respect the differences between men and women. Our world is constantly trying to blur those edges, isn't it, these days? The Bible teaches men how to be men 
and women how to be women. Failure to recognize the Bible's teaching on this leads to all kinds of unhappiness and confusion, not only to homosexuality, but also transgenderism, which is rapidly becoming such a big problem, and the church urgently needs to address it by carefully teaching our young people. I know we're beginning to do this at the Tron already, but we must keep at it. The devil is the father of deception and lies, and the fundamental problem at the heart of this transgenderism is a deception. To imagine that by surgery or by hormone treatments, a man can become a woman or a woman can become a man is simply a self-deception. There are certain brute biological facts about us. There is a givenness, a God-givenness to the nature of each of us, and nothing can alter it. So we must teach this to our young people and help them to embrace the Bible's teaching with gladness. It's the only way to be happy about sex and gender. Well, what then is Paul doing in this whole chapter? He's beginning to describe to Timothy, for the sake of the Ephesians, the nature of a church which is equipped for real gospel service. Timothy, he says, stop that vain, silly teaching. That's chapter 1. And now, Timothy, chapter 2, I'll start to lay before you the characteristics of a real church. They are first, prayer for rulers, so that the gospel can be broadcast in a stable and peaceful society, and second, a proper understanding of the differences between men and women. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, have mercy upon us and help us to be obedient from our hearts to the wonderful and clear teaching that the Apostle, your Apostle, gives to us. We pray especially about this problem of sexuality and uh, all the confusions around it these days. And we do ask that you will help each of us to accept the Bible's teaching clearly and happily and to be able to pass it on to others, especially to our younger people, for whom there are such confusions awaiting them at school and uh, in other places as well. So please have mercy upon us and help, help us as a church congregation here by praying for our rulers and by following the teaching about men and women to commend the gospel to those around us so that they may see the good order, the love, the harmony, the good behavior in our church and that they may be drawn to the one God and the one mediator in whose name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> well, let's turn now for our hymn, not quite our last one because we'll have another one after the communion, but this hymn is number 737, a lovely hymn about loving the Lord, written by Augustine of Hippo who died, I think, in 430 AD. So this takes us back a long way. O oh, matchless beauty of our God, so ancient and so new, kindle in us your fire of love. Fall on us as the dew. Number 737. <laughs>
the Lord's table is a table which is open to all those who truly trust Christ and belong to him. So whatever your denominational background, if you're a Christian, you belong to the Lord, you're most welcome. This is the Lord's table, not the Tron's table. You're most welcome to receive the bread and the wine with thankful and trusting hearts. Our custom here is to, well, stewards will pass it round, and we each eat the, the bread as it comes to us uh, immediately. But when you're past the little cup of wine, just hang on to it, and then we shall all drink it together at the given signal. Well, let's listen to some of the encouraging words that both Christ himself and the apostles have recorded for us in the Bible, which give us the strength and the courage to turn to Christ in faith, despite the fact that we're sinful men and women. The Lord Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That is a great invitation. Nobody is excluded. The Apostle John writes this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever. It's one of the great words of the Gospel. Paul says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves to be fully accepted, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So he came to save us. The Apostle John says this, If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Well, let me read some words from Luke's Gospel, which record the first Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. When the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they'd eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Well, let us pray. Let's bow our heads together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, it is out of your tender mercy that you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his once and for all offering of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world he instituted and in his holy gospel commands us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. So hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we who receive this bread and wine according to your Son Jesus Christ's holy institution in remembrance of his death and passion may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will fill our hearts afresh tonight with gratitude for all that the Lord Jesus has so kindly done for us. 
and in his name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Peter writes, You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So with thankful hearts, let us drink together. Let us pray. Our wonderful and living God, we thank you that through these symbols of the death of Christ, you have reassured us of your favour and goodness towards us, that we are truly members of the body of your Son, and also heirs through hope of your eternal kingdom. So we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to keep us as faithful members of your church and to strengthen us by your spirit so that we may fulfill those good works of love and service and gospel telling which you have prepared for us to do through jesus christ our lord amen let's sing together our final hymn number 453 when i survey the wondrous cross 453 
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen.